right, guys. Um, I think we're starting to get warm in here and whatnot. So um, love seeing the large group here. Uh, welcome to the seventh uh, iteration of the Deaf AI Rally. Um, so we got this thing going back in uh, December. Um, we've had some smaller groups in, like 10, 15 folks uh, for the first couple of sessions. Obviously, this one has generated quite a bit of interest um, since we just uh, had the launch of the U.S. Marine Corps AI strategy. Uh, so we've actually got one of the authors on with us here uh, tonight. Um, so I'd uh, like to be able to at least um, do a, a little welcome here for uh, Dr. and Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jack Long. Um, so he's a Marine Corps reservist. He's currently uh, actually working with me over at the Office of Naval Research. Um, he's currently uh, our Deputy Chief AI Officer. Um, he wears a couple different hats. He's also our lead for our education and training side. Um, he's definitely a, an advisor as well over the Marine Corps side. And that's why he actually has been a part of the Marine Corps strategy um, drafting on that. Uh, but before that, um, he cut his uh, chops there uh, back at Hopkins, did his undergrad, got his PhD there. Uh, and then of all things, um, he went over and wanted to put on the uniform um, and went over and did a couple tours over in Afghanistan. Uh, from there, he transitioned over into the reserves. And then since then, he's had a pretty distinguished career so far. So we went over to McKinsey for a bit. Um, Jack, you also got your uh, MBA over there at Said over at Oxford. Uh, so he's been doing um, quite a bit of stuff in the startup realm, um, doing some spin outs on that. Uh, and then he put the uniform on kind of full time here over the last year. But he's been doing this uh, AI gig for the, the Navy and Marine Corps for the last five years. Um, so, uh, like I said, I, he's got a great background on this. That's why the Marine Corps kind of leaned in on him in order to help write the AI strategy. Um, so it's it's great to be able to have him on. And so I was going to ask him to kind of give uh, an overview of uh, what you've got. Hopefully, y'all been able to actually read through it, um, get a little bit of background on it. But Jack can go ahead and walk through us and then kind of open it up to some discussion points. And we'll see where the con conversation goes from there. So, sure. Jack. Everybody. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Yeah, really appreciate that. So, hey everybody, Dr. Jack Long, um, Lieutenant Colonel, as Nick said as well. The I am on my government, excuse me, I'm not on my government computer because of Zoom, so I'm on my personal, which means I'm actually not able to present, but the Marine Corps AI strategy is open source. It's Distro A, so if you Google it, uh, USMC AI strategy, it should come up, um, and I'll just kind of give you a quick overview of kind of like what we're thinking as we were putting it together and kind of like what the next steps are and then, but really give an opportunity for, for questions. Right. I think it, it, me walking you through what you can easily read isn't the best use of our time. So I'll just start with, I often say when asked, you know, why it's like, you know, what are we doing? It's like, we suck at AI in the department of defense. It's kind of a litmus test comment from me as to, um, where you where you stand on the applicability of AI, the usefulness of AI, and kind of like what it's going to be able to do, as well as how you think the DoD is doing about you know AI in particular, technology in general. I've had people respond to me and say that no, we're doing fine, we're where we should be, and it, to me that's just a kind of an indication of like nope, I'm not a drunk, nope, not a not addicted to heroin, I can stop anytime I want to, and so often I say that just blatantly or you know very simply we suck. At AI, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's a kind of a, a provocative statement, but ultimately, for a number of reasons, we're not great. At, we we aren't where we should be. That's kind of what I mean by more with with AI, and it's a tool that has the potential to do a lot of things. Whether it's war fighting, corporate functions, whether it's maintenance, prediction, whether it's HR, there's a lot of things AI can help us do. We are leveraging it for very few of those. Typically, the DOD, I think we're okay, maybe even a B grade on the ability to bring technology into the service at a slow and steady rate, right? So for technology that evolves at 1%, 2% per year, we have a process for understanding how that impacts what we do, bringing it on board, and updating our processes, policies, and everything eventually. For rapidly growing technology like AI, we're not, right? We, I was looking at something recently where uh, a kind of a policy letter was written 
about how we're going to use AI that almost completely fails to take into account generative AI or multi-agent systems and where we are today, just because it took so long to get through that. Um, the technologies evolved so fast that two years ago, it wasn't useful. It didn't do much. Today, it does a lot more, still not you know, a panacea and all. So with that, <clears throat> I think that AI is a different, or any fast moving technology uh, is a different, requires a slightly different paradigm for how we're gonna bring it into the service, the services, the department as a whole. So that kind of starts off with the very first LOE, our goal for the Marine Corps, which is, hey, we wanna catch up. We wanna make sure we're using this technology. Um, typically when you fight a war of two sides, one is the weaker, the weaker will use the, usually the more disruptive technology because they can imp get it in quicker. And if we're not prepared for that, we could be in trouble. So we want to make sure that we are aware of everything AI could do for us, against us. And that's goal number one, which is linking AI to mission. Got a hammer. What is it useful for when it comes to war fighting? I've got this tool, this ability to complex information processing for artificial intelligence, as we call it. What can I do with it? Do I use our target recognition, computer vision, processing, predictive analytics, decision support, autonomy, all the things that I could potentially do? Where should we be using it? And with that, I'm looking at something like an AI maturity model. Where are we? Uh, how close are we to being able to implement AI for that particular use case? Uh, is the data ready? Is the infrastructure ready? Do we have the models? Do we have the policy in place? So what should we be doing? And then uh, 500 things we could potentially do with it. The 100 things that are somewhat in the next five years, the 20 things that might be near term in the next year to start to think about how to invest in that. So that's that's the purpose of goal number one. Two is once we know what we're going to do with AI, we need the people to do that, right? Got it. I want to use AI for target recognition. I want to use AI for some kind of decision superiority. What it, does the workforce know how to use the tool, develop the tool, deploy the tool, the whole gamut from develop, deploy, use, do we have the people in place to do this? There's no point in, you know, there's technology all over the place. Uh, I like to use the example of Outlook. There's tons of functionality built into Outlook, including messaging, tasking, a bunch of stuff that most of us never use. Same with Excel. It's got so many tools built into it that 99% of users never use. If we just roll out technology, but don't teach people how to use it, we're not going to get the, the value that we could from it. So how do we develop an AI competent workforce? What does that mean? Goal three, line of effort number three is, is scale AI, deploy AI at scale. And what that means is we can do AI in a one-off silo and a one-off use case, but what we really want to do is be able to do it at hundreds, hundred use cases at a time. We want to do it quickly. We want to be able to do it at scale. And what that requires is some kind of enterprise deployed infrastructure, hardware, software, MLOps pipeline, something that we can leverage to develop, store our data, manage our data, develop models, uh, train models, push models out, and, and actually have them inferencing wherever they are, whether they're on the edge, whether they're in your computer when you're sitting in a big office building in the in, the, in or something. So what do we need to do to have that infrastructure, that, that, that enterprise infrastructure that work, works not only with the Marine Corps, the broader Navy, the Marine Corps team, the Department of Defense, and then our allies and partners so we can share all of this and actually be able to leverage the technology writ large. The next two are essentially governance, which takes into account some of the policies that need to go into this, as well as what's the organizational structure. If we and I'll get to this in a minute. If we roll, if we change the organization a little bit, what's the way that the organization, the information flows through that organization, the information is, uh, the organization is able to shift and pivot to use it. Um, so policy as well as kind of organizational pieces. Is there an AI governance board? Are there, um, how does AI governance boards fit into our s and processes, our acquisition processes, our .mlpf process and things like that? And then finally, the final goal we're going after is, is partnerships. What are, we are not going to do this ourselves. Okay, we are not going to deploy AI individually. So we need to partner with the broader DAWN, so the Department of the Navy, the Naval Service as a whole, partner with the broader DOD, the Joint Force, partner with academia, partner with industry to pull in the things that they do better than we do or the things that for them to help us out, partner with our allies and partners overseas. How do we share 
um, how do we create one team when it gets to an actual fight um, or even in a non uh, kinetic environment. So that's the goal of like getting after all of these, these five LOEs and it's putting those in place and assigning um, responsible parties to get after that. So the AI strategy is out right now. We're working to build the implementation plan, assigning um, responsible parties for all the goals and the sub goals that are in the strategy. And then um, essentially put that implementation implementation plan together and kind of march out smartly like we tend to do when we choose to. So with that, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions. Let me see if I can pull up the chat here for a second. Keep going away. Yeah, Jack. I, I mean, so um, I, I guess since I work with you, man, and, and have, have seen this a little bit, I, I'll uh, ask one kind of broad question, maybe to, to help set some things up. Um, so you made mention that uh, DOD has been having an issue on the adoption problem, right? And I, I know that a lot of people are are getting after this, and there are definitely pockets where it's being leveraged better. Um, you're seeing the the full throes of Jake being created, being consolidated into CDAO. Uh, you've seen uh, sub organizations within Navy and Marine Corps team, even Army and Air Force, trying to figure out how to work together on these things. Because as soon as you start working towards leveraging AI, right? It's not really about the AI, it's not about the algorithm, it's about the data, and the data enablement side. So what are you seeing as some of the, the biggest challenges here that the Marine Corps is trying to address by putting a strategy out like this? I'd say that I think the single biggest challenge still comes back to the fact that we don't know what to do with AI. That's our single biggest uh, limitation is that we have this tool the few use cases we've seen, and I say this, the, where, where AI has been successful in the department, um, every single use case I've ever seen has been bottom up. It's been people that had a problem that understood AI and that grew a solution up. So Maven was not some top-down thing. Maven, Maven started as some people that understood, hey, I've got thousands, millions of hours of video, thousands of pictures, billions of pictures. Can I use computer vision model to help flag the interesting things so I can get an analyst that doesn't have to look through all of them? How can I sift through this data, find what I want? So cool, I need to build a model that can recognize the things of interest to me. Um, Harbinger, undersea acoustic use case. Uh, data science and C, Army, similar use cases. People are sitting there going, I, I can use AI to solve this. When we kind of look more broadly and you go look at what a, you know, some of our big tech companies are doing or other stuff or what John Deere, things like that are using AI for. They've done a much better job of understanding exactly like I've got this tool, here's what it's gonna do for my mission set. So you look at John Deere and how they've used AI to really support um, the farming industry, farmers, uh, whether it's for farming, whether it's for vehicle maintenance or other things like that. So for us, our single biggest gap is as soon as you can articulate to somebody that I could do AI, I could use AI to solve this problem or solve this task, it can do this for me. I think you see traction that there's there's belief. There's still a palm issue. There's still money and resourcing and stuff. But broadly speaking, I see us um, looking at AI, hundreds of things we could be doing with it, but very few of those use cases are fully articulated and bubbled up. They are somebody out in the at the deck plate that understands it, can recognize there's a there there, but that doesn't have that ability for that idea to, to flow up. And one of the things that the Marine Corps um, – is putting in the strategy, which came out of the Navy's uh, thought process as well, was that establishing um, task forces for the Navy, task groups for the Marine Corps, but essentially AI cells out in the disparate environment of the organization, out in the fleet and the fleet Marine Force. So across the Marine Corps, essentially serving as special staff officer for AI for that command. So about a dozen Marine Corps commands at the MEFs and at the, at the sort of um, command level, education command, training command, logistics command, things like that. It's the intention is to establish an AI cell called an AI task group in the Marine Corps, whose mission is to take the Venn diagram overlap between this command has a mission, mission essential task, like all the things this, this command is, is tasked with doing, and then overlapping that with the capabilities of artificial intelligence. All right, what are all the things that AI could do what the Venn, the Venn diagram, what's the overlap between those two? So that's the universe of all the potential things that AI could do for that command and then run that AI maturity model across the go. What can we do right now? Oh, we have the data for that. The data is actually accessible and in relatively good shape. We could build a model. Logcom, we could build models for 
predictive maintenance. We could we could do it with one vehicle and we could expand it to other vehicles. We could do modeling of supply chain. We could do modeling of you know computer vision, installations command. We can use AI to, there was a project from Avenger back for the ONR a few years back, looking at using AI for uh, managing installations, getting people on and off faster, right? Simple thing about like, hey, that's just one of those dull things that we suck at. Can we use AI to do better at this? Not the kind of thing that each one of us think of necessarily when we think of AI, but that command, installations command or Bureau of Medicine or NAVSUP. I don't know what NAVSUP's problem is, but if I put AI SMEs, tie them with a command, um, you typically see success. And this is what NGA has seen with their AI teams, is what industry sees when we talk about what's the business use case we want for AI. Identify all the potentialities and then really in, pull the thread, walk the dog on whether AI is actually, are we ready to solve it with this? And also, you know, always throwing in, is AI the best solution? for this problem. There's plenty of places where, yeah, I can solve that with AI. I can also solve it with a Marine with a crayon, right? You know, NASA, the, the classic example I always come back to with NASA developing the pen uh, that can write in space for millions of dollars, the Russians using a pencil. And I say, if you'd asked the Marine Corps, we would have just said, use a crayon. And here you go. Um, so AI is, because AI can solve the problem, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best one. Or maybe solving it at a price point we're not interested in pursuing at this time. Yeah, okay, that's that's way more than we're willing. I'd rather eat the problem and just have the problem. That so, so we want to push those those cells out, those AI task groups out there, and that is linking AI to mission. Right, we're not doing AI to do AI. We're doing AI to accomplish the mission. Again, different commands have missions. So, I don't necessarily know what every command's mission is. Mar four cyber has a mission. What can AI do for Mar four cyber? I'm not. The expert on that. If I did a deep dive, I could be, probably become the expert. But Mar Force Cyber stands up an AI cell. Mar Force Cyber's AI cell could look at that. Mar Sox, Mar uh, Logcom, Blown Island Command, all of our commands, recruiting command. You know, AI tools for recruiting, AI tools for HR and progression training. There's a lot of cool things. Um, I think where there's a, definitely a, a, a positive ROI on AI investment. So, to me, it's if I knew what I was going to do with this technology. I would do it. And when my time at Oxford and in and, and Hopkins and kind of all these years in, in research and science and development has taught me that you go to academia, they have the exact same problem. A bunch of academics working, doing research. They they pursue their own projects, their own passions, but often they don't know exactly what the the deck plate users problem is. And the deck plate users that have the problems don't know what science can do for them don't know what technology can do for them. So they don't know how to ask for it. So you've always got this gap of, you know, how do you bring scientists and kind of get them the problems they could be working on? And how do you like get the deck plate users to understand that science could solve this? And that's that, again, that overlapping Venn diagram. And we create lots of processes in the DOD to look at that. Um, AI, because it's such a fast moving technology, the list of things we could do with AI six months ago has expanded. Um, and is things that we we're like, that'd be a cool thing. It might be five years out, 10 years out, or probably never going to happen. All of a sudden, they're now potentially on the radar as the technology continues to grow. Um, so that's where I think our single biggest gap is. Over. Cool. So it sounds like office space is still relevant in AI. It's good. <laughs> Trying to connect the engineers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, Brian, yep. no, you, you got a question, man? Yeah. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I was I was wondering what programs USMC is looking to stand up um, or to utilize to develop, right? Like uh, AI for the enterprise, AI for the two MEF units, all of the different MARSOC units and such. Like there's Maven, there's Sapphire, there's CDAO, there's Army Lynchpin, Ammo for Navy. Um, I know John Hopkins does a lot of development on the Marine Corps' behalf P through the PMAs, but uh, you guys are standing up your own JADC2 project. Is there going to be an AIML project that we need to be on the lookout for, kind of um, be able to contribute to that in any way? I think that it partly comes down to use case, right? So when you look at what CDO is pushing out um, and where we want to get to, we're looking for um, some kind of federated model when it comes to something. I don't think we're looking for an enterprise solution for a big vendor to do AI for us. Uh, what we want is more of a Lego brick approach 
and that the different pieces that work together, we make them work together. So if you think about naval aviation, right? Naval aviation requires airplanes, pilots, engines, mechanics, aircraft carriers, fuel. We don't go and contract with, you know, a large defense prime to deliver naval aviation for us. We we we, we go and contract for pieces of it. Some of it we do ourselves, like our pilot training. Some of it we contract um, for vendors or for contractors to do. Others we just flat out buy. Um, gasoline being a good example. Uh, so when we put together the AI solution, we put together what, what AI looks like at enterprise. I think we're looking to do something similar, right? So we want to. We're not looking for a single solution, but how do we put these different pieces together? So big piece of um, data infrastructure or AI infrastructure at the hardware the hardware level is uh, storage for data compute, right? Where do we, what kind of compute do we want? Or is it cloud-based? Is it on-prem or is it a combination of both? Will we own some of our compute? And when we leverage big cloud providers, I think the answer is both. Because to some extent, we are going to always have an on-prem AI stack that we have to deal with. It's called a ship that goes sails away from San Diego and goes and bobs around in the ocean in the middle of the Pacific. We got to own the compute on that. We got to own the infrastructure and we got to have people on there to do that. But not as that doesn't necessarily mean that every piece of compute we own is always going to come from us any more than all the electricity we generate comes from DOD generation capabilities. Same thing with the data storage and the same thing with a lot of the tooling we use. Where can we leverage commercial vendors to bring in, you know, what we want to use and where do we occasionally have to build our own um, on that? So I think that as we put this, these, this solution together, you've got a Marine Corps solution that also needs to, to, use, to work with a Navy for a naval dawn level stuff. And like what is going to be a Marine Corps tool versus a Navy tool versus dawn. And then also our data storage and our data infrastructure and our compute and our uh, ML ops pipeline needs to work with Air Force, Army, Space Force, Coast Guard as well. So how do we, and if the Coast Guard wants to bring one type of compute to this and one type of data storage, how do we ensure that ours works with theirs seamlessly? And then this this is part of our partnership, LOE is putting this together and it's like, aha, we also have allies and partners overseas. So how do we train models using data that came from U.S. collection systems as well as allied and partner collection systems? And then what does that mean from a policy standpoint? So how do we make sure that um, AUKUS, great example, how do we make sure that data that's coming through the AUKUS partnership um, can be shared so that we can build better models pulling data in from multiple use cases, all of our you know, NATO allies and things like that, um, and make it interoperable uh, and not it only works, you know, only works on a Marine Corps system as opposed to everybody else's. Hope that answered the question. Over. I, so Brian, I don't want to speak for you, man, but it sounded like he was also asking there, Jack, if it's more something like Army Lynchpin, right? It's it's not completely centralizing. It's just like Jupiter isn't centralizing everything for Navy either, especially on the architecture front. Um, it, I, I think what I was alluding to earlier when I asked the, the initial question to you is that there seems to be a lot of promise around um, a marketplace. Like if things like CDAO has got great NASCAR charts and they're trying to promise a lot of products and services around there. Is there anything the Marine Corps is actually looking to either centralize you? I know you talk about a federated model, but is there anything that's towards like a linchpin style piece that's going to come along with the Marine Corps strategy? It, if I, I think can, that's one of the, yeah, oh, go ahead. No, go if, ahead, I can add, if I can add, Nick, yeah, I mean, so it's it's yeah, the linchpin model is they're supposed to be the AI factory for the army. An organization in the army has a problem. They come up to linchpin. They say, this is my problem. All right, cool. I might have already built that solution so I can push that to you without you having to waste your 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 uh, government dollars. Is there going to be a program like that in Marine Corps where someone is actually going to be able to say, you know what? Someone built that six months ago. Don't waste your money. Go over here. See what they can do to do for you. That is, you're describing this uh, problem set of LOE3, AI at scale, right? So what is that hardware software infrastructure that exists? How do we want to structure it? And when it comes to governance, what does it look like? Do we roll out a development environment that everybody is on? Um, one, kind of like we're all on Outlook and it all works through you know, 365. Is it that model that we need to get to? Or can I do a plug and play model, right? You know, we've discussed often been discussed, what's the right number of DevSecOps environments um, that, that we should have? Like, 
one is probably not the right answer, but neither is 500. And so I think part of understanding what being able to do this at scale is, is figuring out exactly what that looks like. You know, is it, is it the linchpin model? Is it, does linchpin roll up and become a DOD environment, you know, that's federated between linchpin and Maven and other things with, with Harbinger and it, you know, then things like the ammo tools exist in them, other tool sets. And we create this very similar to the internet. You just plug another computer in and you're on, you know, it's that kind of decentralized ability to bring different tools and pieces to it as you need them. Um, that's what LOE three or goal three for the Marine Corps is to figure out is to kind of like put that in place. Hey, Shannon Vaughn, you had a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for putting this uh, on guys. Cause uh, so I'm, I'm coming out, I'm an army guy coming out of army futures command. Uh, oh. I just took over my new role. I'm the new, uh, it's a terrible title, but I'm the new chief of AI for the Army Reserve uh, military intelligence function, right? So chief of AI for for the Merc, uh, and so big AFC. You know, we we've got our AI strategy that we're marching towards. Uh, the Merc commander she stood up uh, an AI task force. I'd love to hear that the Marine Corps is doing the same thing. Like, you know, push down to the people who actually know what the hell they're talking about, like the people who touch it every single day. Uh, that said, I get tossed into this role. Uh, we're standing up our our AI task force. Um, we have six lines of effort, very similar to what what uh, was in the, the Marine Corps AI strategy, which I really appreciated. Um, I think, actually, it's funny. So uh, seeing General Glavy, like on, I think it was page two or page three, I, I was in London with him at a conference about a month or two ago. You mentioned information sharing at scales with partners and allies, especially like AUKUS and others, like that is an area that we definitely want to focus into uh, because, you know, every services doctrine says every future fight is a joint fight. What I kind of want to pick at is how it, it's such a broad problem, right? And I, and I love that you guys put something out, but as somebody who also has to be the author of the Army's MI, you know, AI strategy, it's 14 pages because it has to be broad. How do you how do you pick apart those lines of effort and then say this is the one that we're gonna get after first? Because that's what we're that's what we're running into, is that we've got six lines of effort. And you know, one of them is just it's not really AI, it's business process automation. Right. And it's like, yeah, we we could throw AI at writing awards. We could throw AI at uh, object detection on uh, UAVs. We could throw AI at, you know, any number of, of problem sets. I didn't see in the strategy. And so that's why I want to be here. How are you guys going about choosing what is the right thing with the right personnel to get after the problems that you could apply AI to these hard problem sets. Uh, the beautiful thing about this is you basically delegate that decision to somebody else. And you delegate that well, that's why I'm here. I delegated it to you, Jack. Yeah. I, I delegate it to you so, and then you tell me how to do my job. <laughs> I, we, and that this goes back to the task groups and sort of like every command has a mission. Right, right. So installations command, you've got a mission. I don't know exactly what all of your mission is, nor do I know where AI can work, but you have an AI task group with AI experts at SMEs to look at that yourself and you make that decision. Where is the biggest bang for the buck? And the same thing in the Navy, right? What three third fleet may have as a problem they can solve with AI near term may be different than what sixth fleet is looking at. All right. So and then as we build those things, some of those solutions may be cross cutting. If you look like the 160th, the Night Stalkers, what they did with one of the early projects in aviation maintenance, the they took, you know, they they built predictive maintenance models for their helicopters. How can we understand the better conditions-based maintenance type model? AI2C in the Army is looking to potentially roll that out to all of their aviation assets. That's one of those things. If you see something that works in one spot, they'll be the lead on focus on building it out. And when it works more broadly, we can then port that across the, the broader service of it works. But AI for award writing, that's absolutely falls under mRNA and some of our things. If they look at that as a use case, they do the AI maturity assessment 
and they decide that's something they want to pursue with the amount of resources they have, we could go after it. Recruiting command, same thing. I'm a big, one of the things we looked at at the Navy did some kind of ideation on would be Navy recruiters spend a lot of time uh, doing paperwork to reach out to potential recruits, right? Can you use generative AI to generate what's a little bit more than a form letter to customize that letter a little bit to individual people? I don't know if that's a good use case or not. I don't know how good of an ROI there is on that, but that's what a task group or task force at recruiting command that's got that mission could walk through and the AI SMEs could go, okay, what is it? What is the, the maturity of AI we can look at right now? What is your day-to-day -day experience of a recruiter? Where do we lose people? You know, education command, the same thing. Should we be deploying AI agents to help with education as personalized tutors? Should we do it to help the uh, instructors? I, I okay. That's where we kind of de defer that out to those commands to go look at it and be experimentation okay. arms. Can I ask one follow-up? Because I think you're on the right track, at least where I'm I'm going. The thing that I'm trying to caution against, at least on my side, is recency bias or closeness bias. So if like we we have a bunch of guys who are like, hey, like I saw a guy who was like, Hey, I work for Google Cloud. Google Cloud's the way to go. Like, how do I get away from that? Because it, it obviously everybody references the thing that they know or, or they're close to. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that? we're actually presenting the right thing versus the recent thing or the close thing like that. That's what I'm trying to caution against. And I don't know if we can, that just might be human, you know, instinct. Yeah. I think partly it is that it's just one of those things that you got to read about thinking Shane Paris or Charlie Munger about like how to not make bad decisions and, and thinking about thinking kind of things Two, what I think the that's short term, um, type one thinking, thinking fast and slow, that's fast thinking, which I think is fine for ideation. And then it's like, okay, I'm going to throw a bunch of things against the wall in an ideation session. I'm going to come up, I'm going to expand the uh, aperture of what I'm looking at. Now I'm going to then neck those down when I go through an analysis process of the AI maturity model. So, ooh, LLMs for this X, Y, or Z. Then I actually start walking through what that would take to, to do that use case. And then I see, can I quantify an R? Can I quantify an I? And I do the math to say, what's the value of this investment when I get to that assessment? So I'm okay with it on the ideation phase. And a lot of what I see is people love talking about this, love talking, talking, talking. When you actually sit down to start doing the analysis on the use cases is where you don't see as much. So that's where I think that that second step or that step where you have to start narrowing down what you want to focus on is where a lot of the silliness, a lot of that will go away and be replaced by, eh, okay, that ain't going to work yet. That's that's three years out, or I need something else. Shannon, um, I'd, I'd love to be able to you offline too, though, man. I mean, Jack and I are, are wrestling with this all the time. Like, there, there's there's an alignment piece that Jack alluded to. I mean, that's goal number one, right? It's mission alignment. And so down echelon, people are seeing the different use cases. But at some point in time, we're reaching a decision cycle and, and keeping this, guys, right, at least it – the, the completely unclass level right here. You know, there are strategy documents the Army has for you, right, that is able to point towards mission sets that we have to go after. We've, on the Navy side, decided there are certain mission sets that we are definitely aligning on because there's decision choices on the infrastructure buy that you're, that you're having to do because the scalability and the cost piece of this is growing exponentially. So you have to be able to present that as trade-offs to leadership. And so where there's low hanging fruit, especially in the business process piece domain, that's not sucking up a lot of compute and a lot of trans, you know, uh, uh, comms stuff. That's one thing you start getting the war fighting like aspects of this. And I think it's a different piece that you're asking for, Shannon. So love to yeah. be able to chat offline, man, if, if that works. That would be solid. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. And yeah. Jack, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah. And happy to chat too. I like the guys at AI2C. Um, Good friends with them, Mike, Michelle, Isaac Faber. Uh, we, we work very closely with them, and I think they do a lot of the great work. So um, definitely help you, happy to help show the Army you know, what right looks like. Yeah. We, we prey on fluently. Yep, so we're, yeah. we're ready. We're yeah. ready. <laughs> no. even, even the way we spell, yeah, you can figure out even our poor spelling. Um, <laughs> I'll do a quick hit answer. Lou Brock, yes, fully familiar with Project Eagle, the Cunningham Group, Toto. Um, we've actually synced that group at DC Aviation up with Task Force Ellison at NAV Air 
for a naval AI project as, as they roll these things out. So what does it look like if with um, if we're going to try to go after Alfred's a very long term solution? We're looking out 15 to 20 years, or at least that's where we want to be in 20 years. The question is how much how much of that could be short term um, and what, what are the next steps on that one? So, yes, very familiar with that one. Uh, and that's that's exactly the kind of interesting idea that's come up. Cool. It's uh, it's a great idea. Let's start putting some flushing out around it. And part of this is, OK, if you want to do this, what is the infrastructure we need? Who do you need to have trained? What does it look like at all these different pieces for maintenance and, and Alfred and um, some of the other pieces that are going to go into this as well? Thank you very much for that answer. I just I've learned not to assume connections are made. I like to make sure that they are. But uh, yeah, I'd love to connect later on uh, as we move forward helping them. Uh, I'm sure our paths will cross, but I think it would be great to work with you. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then cool. for the the question about how do we pull the pockets of innovators out? Like I, this is one of the things we've been doing for a while. So uh, we stood up the Naval AI summits way back when. The very first one had eight of us were at it. I think it was six to eight people, less than a dozen, got together. Hey, let's let's make a pact fellowship to on FAI in the Navy and the Marine Corps. Now, those summits have grown. Um, they're, they vary in frequency between, I think one year we almost did four of them. Uh, right now, the target is roughly three per year. So once every four months-ish, give or take what month this lands in, things like that, the next one being in September. But they've always been open to anybody in the DOD that's doing AI, right? They're not by invitation only. Um, it, a number of those bottom-up initiatives have actually been presented at the summit for the first time that got visibility that made them, got them traction across the larger organization. So uh, data science and C, uh, CSG brief on that open ship, I'm trying to think what else has popped up at the summit for the first time. Um, Aries was another one, things like that, that people have gone and developed. Um, and hey, look what I've done, right? Because AI, to me, I think one of the things I didn't mention earlier is I think AI development is being democratized right now, kind of the same way that being able to build a website in the late 90s, the tools and infrastructure was in place such that the cost of building a website and the ability to do that all of a sudden went from only a few people could to pretty much anyone that knew how to learn a few things could do so. And you saw something similar with the app store infrastructure from either Apple or um, Android marketing, the late 2008, 9, 10 timeframe, where all of a sudden we went from an iPhone was a lock. The very first iPhone had no apps other than what Apple put on it. And very quickly, there's an app for that became a running joke for a couple of years, right? Because you had the supercomputer with its capabilities, the ability of you to develop an app to leverage what that, that phone could do was democratized very quickly. So you're limited only by your imagination. So you saw it with websites, you saw it with kind of the apps that went on these, these systems. And I think you're seeing it with AI now that the compute, the actual processing to, to train models is relatively, it's easy to get to. A lot more of the data exists. It's amazing how much data out there is open source and given away. And people are like, oh, I took all of the river traffic on the Mississippi River, which is all open source from the Bureau of Navigation through something. I've, I've seen them. Downloaded all that, built a model for things. And that was something that most people wouldn't think about, but the cleverness or the, the ingenuity of the person that did, boom. Um, so I'm, when I look at this, I see a lot of, I see the ability to harness bottom-up innovation in AI. And the question is, how do you then let that come up? Part of it is through the summits and things like that. Also part of it is those task groups that are out there, right? You're pushing the experimentation farther down into the fleet. So it doesn't all have to come up to a service level, you know, assessment for the Marine Corps, like McWill and CDNI and for the Navy, some of those places. You can you, you push experimentation out uh, broadly. We're never going to capture all of it, right? The data science at sea happened to be, I don't want to say it was lightning in a bottle, but it was like, there's probably a couple other places where that happened and the few pieces that needed to be in place to get that sky lined up to, you know, S S1 level weren't there. But you put enough of that and you'll see it. And I think we'll capture some of the, the good innovation, especially when you put out, we're looking for it. People will raise their hand and say, I got something cool for you. Over. Thank you, sir. 
Um, yeah, the, the, the biggest uh, issue that uh, we've been experiencing is, uh, I, I would agree with the, the statement that um, the AI development has been democratized, but uh, I would say that um, in terms of implementation, uh, there's still a lot of people that are extremely hesitant about that. Um, and there's a lot of people that have made their careers off of uh, playing playing um, on the safe side, uh, mitigating risk. Uh, and I understand that perspective, but it makes it extremely difficult to try to uh, keep pace with adversaries um, when we're crippled by either an ATO or an inability to utilize real mission data um, to to develop uh, and implement uh, AI models. Yeah, I would agree. I think that there's a structural issue with if you are an inspector, if you are a person whose job is to review, if you always say yes, like if you're an inspector and never find fault with anything, if your job is to review stuff and editor and never make any changes, people immediately question like, what are you doing? Like you're the editor here and you haven't made a single change to anything. People question whether you're actually doing your job. You inspect and never find any fault. So the people whose job it is is to be those reviewers often have to sometimes find more than there might be or otherwise like flag things for that. The reason of like, well, if I don't, people are going to ask what I'm doing. And, and institutionally, I also think that we tend to have a culture of I prove how clever I am in the meeting or in the broader working group by figuring out all the ways your project's not going to work. Right. And I've, I've noticed repeatedly. And I, when I, when I talk to people about this, it's like, Hey, it's not about getting to yes or getting to that. It's just, are you, are you finding it? Do you find intellectual validation by pointing out all the reasons this couldn't work? And there are some people out there that do that. Hey, my job was to tell you why everything would go wrong. So you can fix it. But I think that's also a cultural thing. It's like, don't tell me the 20 reasons this couldn't work, right? That's that's not what we're here for, to just throw darts at it. But institutionally, you just see that. Um, not that people aren't good or bad. It's just that on a bell curve, we tend to shift that direction more than we probably should. Over. Yeah. Um, Clint, Alanis, are you, are you still on, buddy? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, it's Alanis. No big deal. It's it's oh. only wrong my entire life. Uh, hey, Jack, happy to, to track you down finally. I, I had a different question originally, but just to maybe to, to dovetail or to follow on from that discussion point that you just had, mainly because now I'm on the other side of the fence looking at it from an industry standpoint, right? And from industry, it looks slightly different. So I guess I would ask when you think or when you say that AI has been democratized, which I don't disagree with, uh, at least in the commercial space, I'd be curious, like, what AI are you talking about, right? Like, AI means a million different things to a million different people. Some of those AI applications are are extremely uh, complex, demanding. It's not so much that models can't be built as much as the talent required to compile uh, kind of multimodality and then, and then make it, frankly, navigate through the various IT requirements amongst the different services on how to then make it compatible with the service requirements uh, and then in some way get past policy restrictions. So maybe just add on to what you're talking about on kind of how you envision the Marine Corps doing that and across the services since you also work at least at, at the ONR level. Yeah, I think when I say AI is democratized, like the ability to build a tool that works to solve a task, like anyone can do that if you're clever enough and have the skill set, right? Not everyone can go just make an app tomorrow. There are there are skills you need to be able to have, but the same way that like machine working with computers went from having to pro build your own computer, the program and machine code that actually know how to code. Most of us are able to use computers today through point and click. That's kind of the democratization. Like we, we abstract some of the complexity of the task to other layers of the stack down. So you as a person, now people with a phone are just pick, pecking away at their fingers, you know, with their thumbs. There are people that you can build very, um, useful, powerful AI tools by just some open source um, software, Weka. You can get on Weka if you've got access to the compute and you've got access to the data, you can play with it. Now, the odds of your model being, you know, game changing and perfect aren't that high any more than every single startup that had created a website in 1998 was going to be a billion dollar company. So that's kind of about the democratization. It's no longer 
the same thing. I don't need large, I don't need Google to build every AI model for me now. So the, the now I see all these startups coming with an interesting uh, AI solution to a problem they identified. They think somebody has, right? And in the defense business, we're a little different. I think our requirements process is very ill suited to when it came to when it comes to AI. I think overall the requirements process retards innovation and slows it down, partly because you have to recognize that you want something for our requirements process to work. And where that whole bring the the warfighter doesn't always know what their problem is or what science can define. So we often in a perfect world, we would just be like, what are your problems? Well, these are them. But even things you don't think are a problem or that could be a problem solved, you're like, you wouldn't define as a problem. You're like, oh, this is just the way the world works. I just have to deal with this, right? You know, so but somebody as a scientist might say, I that actually should not be a problem. You should not have to deal with this. Like DTS should not be a mess. Like, you know, you should not have issues with your cat card. You should not have issues with their like submit a VAR every time you want to go somewhere should not be a thing. Right. How have we not solved that problem? But then as you just beat into bureaucrats, it is. To me, I think the way our acquisition process works, partly because of that requirements process, again, there were not requirements written for some of the most interesting AI tools I've seen built recently. Someone just went and made one. And they're like, Aries, for example, never would have, no one ever would have sat down and wrote a requirement for that tool. Somebody just built one and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't even know I didn't, I didn't even know I needed that. And to me, that's where innovation is, is you really, somebody's able to create something and, and show you all of a sudden after you use it, you're like, I had no idea I even had, that was a problem. And now that I've used this tool, I love it. TiVo to me was a very classic example. We were so used to watching TV as per a schedule and all of that. And all of a sudden TiVo came out and like, now you could just watch TV whenever you wanted to and speed through commercials. You didn't realize how much of a restriction having to watch a TV at a set time was and how much of not being able to fast forward through the commercials and not being able to binge watch, how much that completely shifted it until you got a taste of the other side. Innovation to me is partly that. And our requirement process is all getting back to, I, I want a faster horse kind of stuff without the ability to really imagine what could be. So I think it's a long-winded way of saying it's very difficult to answer exactly that because I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I need sometimes until somebody shows me something, which is where I really love to harness the innovation of like, I could spend hours trying to list out all my problems or I could spend hours doing this and it's surprised me with what you think uh, you can solve for. And then how do we, once we see it, how do we quickly pull it in? When, even if there wasn't a requirement for it, but as soon as you see there's a tool that solves a problem, you go, holy crap, we should have had a requirement for a tool like this, but we never knew this was a thing. So anyway, I'm babbling, but that's kind of my take on it. I appreciate that. If anything, it's worse than you said, even when y'all know it, or not you, but even when the government knows what its requirement is, the acquisitions process is still a mess. So all good. I mean, I think, Clint, I mean, to, to your point, though, too, like part of this is um, for the, the larger um, system of systems integration side, like that's a that's a tough thing. The democratization, like, I mean, that this goes into um, uh, Marx's like uh, question there, too. Like there, there are definitely certain tools that should be democratized. Like, yes, there is an AI, like a policy coming out to where, well, at least we discussed it yesterday. It may be a policy coming out that allows people, carp launch to say, yes, you can use ChatGPT or Llama or whatever, right? In order to be able to figure out some small little business process internal to your command that does add, you know, business efficiencies. Like that should be allowed. Like, be like, Put a disclaimer in there. Yes, you need to make sure no CUI beyond that, blah, 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 blah. It's the larger, I think, complexity that you're also getting at to where I do think we need to be kind of deliberate on it, on pulling the mission thread through and identifying what are the tools um, that we can leverage that uh, apply an effect. But they're, they're so system to systems integrated now that I think, to, to Jack's point, we, we need to try to liberalize it a little more, but we're always going to be constrained by the risk profile there too. So it's a give and take as we're trying to design some of these more complex systems. So 
No, and and not, I don't want to. We don't have to talk about it at all. But the thing, just from again, from a startup standpoint, you know, the acquisition cycle is my runway, or vice yeah. versa, depending on how you look at it. And that's uh, anyway, it adds it it adds additional complexity to exactly what you're talking about. So, yeah. all good. Yeah. Uh, uh it also add. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to add, Nick brings up a great point of kind of when I talk about what I want to see when it comes to innovation. So when I was at Oxford, after I finished, after I graduated, I stayed on as a fellow at the university as an innovation fellow, looking at how you do innovation, right? And doing innovation, doing a startup there. Um, one of the things I really come away with when it comes to being an innovative organization, if you want to be an innovative organization, you've got to inspire innovation. Innovation is not about ideation. I look at innovation as a two-step process. One, I think up a better way of doing something. That is the easy part. The hard part is for my new idea to replace my old idea, the old idea has to go away. The speed of innovation is driven by the stickiness of the old idea, not how good the new idea is. So if you back to your chemistry of a rate-limiting step, it's like, I don't care how good your new idea is. If your old idea is very hard to stop doing, get rid of. And a lot of our the things that we do in the military are traceable back to Marine Corps or, or service level orders, DOD orders and instructions, policy, and or law, right? Law put forth by Congress. We have a process to go change all of that. But to change something that's written into federal law requires a lot of effort to do that, which means to stop doing something so I can start doing it a better way requires a lot of time and effort. Often great innovators don't want to spend their time doing that. They're wanting to go on to the next idea. So one of the things I look at is like when I think about that innovation is that two-step process. It's focusing, that's why I tell senior leaders, don't worry about the ideation. Like the Marine Corps is full of Lance Corporals who are lazy as fuck, right? Who are way more idea way more great ideas than you have about how to do things more efficiently your best innovators are clever lazy people that are like i don't want to do this i'm not going to work harder i'm going to figure out how to do this so i can get out of here by one o'clock to go to the golf course they're your best innovators they have the ideas don't worry about that what you want to do is you want to remove the barriers what you want to get to to be an innovative innovative organization is permissionless innovation no one should if you want to be an innovative organization no one should have to ask permission to innovate you need to remove those barriers. Innovation should be a natural yes, 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 yes. You should, there should be a reason to say no, not a reason to ask permission to innovate. So if you can get the permissionless innovation, that's when you're truly an innovative organization because you don't have the bureaucracy stopping it. Uh, and I'll go off my soapbox. Yeah. So I think we've got time for one more uh, question here, Vince. Yeah, I'm Vince Coviello with Black Hayes Group. I'm covering with Cameron and, and Drew, Cameron with Drew tonight. Um, my question was more about when the Marine Corps was looking at their uh, strategic plan, did, and the last couple of uh, questions and comments have touched on it, but the overall management of risk of AI, um, it had, was there any thought to, um, you know, bad data being injected, um, algorithm reliability um, and assessment of that. And, you know, uh, the tools, if uh, an algorithm has changed and it alters the reliability on another previously reliable algorithm. I mean, there's so many aspects of risk. Um, and as the former CIO for six months at the National Ground Intelligence Center, ATOs are a nightmare and I respect everything that everybody said about the IT problems that going forward on this as well. Thank you. Yeah, the short answer, yes, that's that's a core part of what we're doing. Uh, part of the governance is putting the policies forth to one, DOD's got Vaultus as a framework and things like that um, for the data, you know, visible, accessible, understandable, link, trusted, interoperable, and secure. So part of that is, um, the RAI framework for the Department of Defense has traceability um, and essentially auditability of any AI tool you've deployed. So I've got a model, I've built it, it's out inferencing on the edge, it's running. Can I actually pull back to how that model was trained, the data it was trained on, can I go back and audit the data? So we think very carefully and that's to understand, okay, what are, understanding what adversarial attacks on AI are. You know, and there's 
different ones. I can adversarial attack on the inferencing. I can adversarial attack on the training. I can adversarial attack on data poisoning. There's all kinds of fun stuff I can do. It's absolutely part of the thinking uh, when we were putting this together. And part of this is knowing what we could do to adversarial AI, understanding what they could do to us and making sure that we're building these things in a way that either eliminates or minimizes that risk. Often one of the most critical things I say when it comes to AI, there's a, there's a saying, all models are wrong, right? But some are useful, okay? No, no, whatever model we build when it comes to artificial intelligence is not, not perfect. It will have failure modes. A big thing you want to understand is it's okay to use a model if you understand how it's going to fail and its failure is not critical to it, right? Hey, if I know that this ladder always falls over to the left, that might be fine as long as where it lands, it lands in the yard or something like that. And that's an acceptable risk I can take about using this. Hey, this model, false positives, but not a lot of false negatives. So this model is doesn't have a lot of false positives. This model often gets a tank as a turtle for whatever reason, right? Known problem. Understanding some of these things allow you, goes into the risk decision of using it. And that includes how this can be attacked. Right. It may be that, aha, uh -huh, I understand that this model has certain attack vectors. So if I deploy it, I have 99% coverage here and 1% uh, where I don't is a potential risk inject, similar to how I would put a fence around an installation, right? Or blind spots with a camera. As long as I know they're there um, and I then can take risk or take actions to mitigate that additional risk, I'm fine. So I think that thinking through that, and that to me is the core definition of algorithmic warfare. What an algorithmic warfare team will think through. There is a model builder who will inform a model user and that other piece of it the same way we do for electronic warfare and, and you know uh, communications. We understand how what we radiate can be detected. So that affects the way we do our comm plan when it comes to MCON, uh, low emission, things like that. We recognize that, yep, I might be detectable in, in, in a low em emitting area. But it's I'm hard to detect. I'm not a zero, but now I understand this a little better. So um, yes, that's all. That is a number of parts of linking out a mission. Um, it's all embedded in that, a part of the workforce too. You know, the people, the tools, and understanding that, and it goes back to that. So cool. Well, thanks, Jack. Um, really appreciate it, man. Uh, great discussion. I really appreciate you kind of providing kind of just an overview, but also just your thoughts uh, here in the AI realm writ large. Um, I mean, really appreciate you guys bringing forward the questions too. And I really appreciate kind of the audience, the broader audience here tonight too. So if there's other discussions that y'all would like to have as a group, that's the whole reason why we started this. It's an informal collision point. There are formal channels that Jack and I can talk through on strategy stuff. So, I mean, even if there are like follow-on conversations, like Shannon, I'll reach out to you, man, like for direct follow-on discussions, like on the military front. But if there's other stuff that this is, I don't know, sparking conversation points on, please use the Slack channel or even just kick emails around with each other. And then if there's something that people want to bring into this forum, it's every month, guys, it's that first Thursday of the month. Um, so we're hoping to be able to have somebody from CDA on, um, next month, still iron that piece out. But if there's future conversations y'all want to have, please bring those, uh, topics forward and love to be able to continue the conversation here. So hope you guys have a wonderful night. Thanks again, Jack. Um, thanks everybody. We'll talk to y'all soon. Well done. Appreciate it, boys. Yep. Out here. Happy to, happy to do it. Yeah, have a great you. evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.